Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. I'm Ryan Morris, and we have a show for you today. It's all about being worthy. Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. I'm Ryan Morris, and as always, I am here with your host, Nicholas T. Smith. You know what the truth is, really, is that you're always worthy. So we're going to talk about how to feel worthy. And uh, if you haven't subscribed on YouTube, go ahead and do that now. And join us on Facebook, a tribe of Giants, where we have a giant support network for you. Nick, do you want to introduce our guest today? I do. I almost want to sing this song. There she is. <laughs> it's America. No, it's different, huh? Yes. <laughs> it is different. That's the wrong yeah, pageant. Right. So, <laughs> so, Can't tell yeah. you how many times I get that, though. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, my bad. So we have a uh, former Miss USA, Terry. That's Brown. the right pageant. Yeah. She's the founder of Women's Women Leaders of Love. And is a love expert, inspirational speaker, spiritual coach, and change agent for women and their families. She's the author of several books, including the award-winning The Enlightened Mom, as well as her newest book, Women Leaders of Love. For over 20 years, Terry has been inspiring women to raise their worthiness quotients by creating a deeper connection to themselves and to God so that they feel nurtured in every area of life and become pioneers of change for their families, communities, and the world. So we're glad to have you here. Thanks, guys. I you love ready? being here. Thank you. You ready to dive into your your story, your journey? I'm ready. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always ready. <laughs> so we want to we we love to go back in time just to lay the foundation for everything. You know, what was life like growing up for you? What was mm -hmm. family life like? You know, we were the typical American family. Dad was out in the workforce. Mom stayed at home and took care of us. That was a typical American family back then. Now it seems yeah. like both parents are working. But back then, that's the way our family was. We right. I was raised in a town of 4,000 people in Arkansas, Cabot, Arkansas. We had two stoplights, okay? I mean, there was not a whole lot going <laughs> on there other than sports and, you know, just being involved in school. And that's that's what I did. I was really, really involved in school. And, and I think I made a decision to do that when I was a little kid. And the reason is, is that it was during the women's movement, right? I'll be 60 in a couple of months. And so I was raised in the 60s and 70s. So for me, my dad would say, you can be anything you want to be. He really attached to the women's movement in saying that you are capable. You can do anything. I was the one going out and shooting guns with him. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I was out in the mowing the yard. I'd much rather have been outside doing things than in the house being the female, right? And so, because of that, I really attached myself to my dad's energy. I I thought his way was the right way and the only way. And I also saw him being God in our home. I actually had a boyfriend tell me that years later. He said, your dad's like God in your home. And what that meant was, is that daddy had the last say so. He was mm. the one who was the authority in the house. Mama suppressed herself. It was very much that old paradigm. And so I didn't want to be that suppressed person, right? I wanted yeah. to be that person who lived and who lived with more, you know, doing more and being more. And so I attached myself to daddy's ways. But what that did is that in my mind, I had to always prove myself. I was always mm. out trying to be the best in school, very, very competitive, uh, always trying to have the best grades, be a great athlete. I was a good athlete. I wouldn't say I was great. So I kind of didn't make it to that level. But, you know, it was one of those things that it was always being at the forefront. And what that did is that put me on a hamster wheel. I constantly felt as if I were racing. I was always in emotional chaos about mm. how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I? It wasn't that I was consciously thinking, how do I be the best? But it was just something inside of me that like you're you're never quite good enough in a way. Is that right? Yeah. It was it was the sense that I just I it, I don't know. Have you ever had that feeling where you feel like you've attained something and instead of celebrating it and in and enjoying it, 
all you can do is think about the next thing that has to be done. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people feel that yeah. way, right? I mean, I think that would be the classic overachiever, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. If they put yeah. in a, you know, a description of a classic overachiever, that would be it. And and that was who I was. And and I kept what I now understand is that I was constantly trying to win love and approval. I was mm. constantly trying to be seen, heard, and valued. I saw daddy as the one being seen, heard, and valued in our home. And mm. I wanted to be that. So I just lived on a hamster wheel and I was an emotional mess. I had anger issues. When I was 15, I got molested by a modeling. Um, he, I don't know if he was an agent, but it was a like a school for modeling and he, he molested me. And so from that point on, I found myself kind of shrinking a little bit. I mm. started pulling back. I was always in the in group in school and I started pulling back and away from people. Um, it was, it was, I, I didn't tell anybody and I suppressed, yeah. suppressed, suppressed. And so I got angrier and angrier. And I remember my dad saying to me, you, you're really angry and you're a lot like I am because his dad was very abusive and he said, you need to learn to suppress that anger rather than oh, saying, wow. let's yeah. talk yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Instead, you need to hide that away. Yes. And so yeah, the wow. more I suppressed, the angrier I got. And I just stayed on that hamster wheel until I was in college and something said, you have to step away. And it was my second semester of my sophomore year in college. Just a few months prior, I've been trying to beat up my boyfriend, put my fist in this kitchen window. I mean, you can imagine. I was like, yeah, this girl had great. anger yeah, issues, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was so, crazy. Yeah, I kind of want to go down that uh, that path a little bit on the okay. anger because what I'm hearing in this is when when that voice gets stifled, that voice of I'm not feeling complete, I'm not feeling uh, recognized, um, mm -hmm. accepted. Uh, and and what we'll find probably toward the end of this is that that acceptance really comes from within. But we put so much weight on what others think. Oh yeah. And then, and then when we're not feeling that, we're feeling um, not seen. We start to get angry because anger is almost this thing that gets you into action. It's almost like my voice isn't going to come out just by my my will alone. Mm -hmm. So anger pushes it, and right. then it comes out almost violent and destructive. It's like you got something to say and you're not saying it. So we get angrier and angrier because we're not holding to what we what we really need. Right. Is that accurate for you? I mean, that is so totally accurate. And, and here was what was going on for me is I had this battle going on inside of me. I wanted to be like my dad, but yeah. I was so programmed to be like my mother. Mm. Don't receive. And it, both mom and dad, neither one of them were good at receiving. They put my sister and me first. Then they'd put each other first. And then they'd put themselves last. Wow. Well, that sets up the precedence of it's not okay to receive. That love equals not receiving. Wow. So even though I would have this abundance flood into me, I couldn't receive it. I couldn't celebrate it. And I just kept suppressing and suppressing and suppressing, as you, you know, as we were talking about. And so... What was sad about it is that the suppression of my feelings, because my mom especially, I mean, she'd say, now, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, she did not want you to rock the boat. And what she was actually saying was, don't be who you are because wow. I have a voice. Yeah, right. Wow. Wow. Every time we tell our kids, be good, act this way, do this way. I mean, you have to have boundaries, right? You want to have, you want to teach your children respect, but you teach them that by respecting yourself and respecting them. And then yeah. they learn that, right? It's not right. about you have to be respectful. No, it's how it's your actions. Yeah. But is that, my, is that how she was raised though? I mean, that's probably oh, the, the, the absolutely. generational, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, my mother, she was the oldest of eight and my grandmother at mm. any time, one of the younger siblings made a mistake. She blamed my mother. She'd say, go get your switch. And she'd Oof. switch my mother to the point where she bled on her legs. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> and, and, you know, when I look at that and I say, well, mom, you came from abuse. And even though I loved my grandmother and she changed over time, she was young mother and she was doing what she had been taught. Right? We yeah, do this generational yep. thing. And I'm so thankful. My mother said she hit me with a fly swatter when I was two. And when she saw the welts on my legs, she said, I'll never do that again. And luckily yeah. they did not become that spanking family. It was, you know, it was, it was more, it was, there was some of it, but, but it stuck with me. Let me tell you, because when you have been spanked, there is a tendency to always please. There's a tendency to do what you think is going to get. Yeah. 
approval rather than being punished. And so I became that person who was always seeking approval because I did not want to be punished. This, this is such a great topic. I mean, I, I was spanked growing up and bare bottom. My mom would get a spoon. Mm -hmm. and a spoon. <laughs> that is, is um, well, and a belt. I got the belt too. Sometimes oh. there were times as a kid, I would put magazines in there to try and hide, the, <laughs> you know, like to soften it. And if you find the magazines, it was worse, you know? Oh, yeah. And, I just um, learned to clench my butt cheeks so yeah. tight. Yeah. That didn't but hurt. You, but the you spoon know what's so break. interesting is that people don't realize, they say, well, I'm fine. I got a spanking and this mm. is what we need. What people don't realize is the wiring that happens in the brain. When we start getting spanked and we're, we're not held with compassion, asking what's going on, what's hurting inside of you. It's like with my dad, when he told me to suppress my, suppress my anchor, thankfully he didn't, you know, get in my face and yell at me. But when he told me to suppress my anger, he didn't, he, he, sh the other way would have been what's hurting, honey, what's going on. What's, what's going on inside of you that's causing you to lash out because underneath the anger is mm. pain, is sadness, is, is grief, is shame, is guilt. There's something going on. Let me help you walk through this. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. And, and this is what we're missing in our families. This is what, I mean, it's when, when my, I was married for 17 years and my husband died and my daughter, my youngest daughter, I have two biological daughters. She was in the eighth grade. Well, the way she deals with anger is she lashes out like I did, or not anger, but pain, and she lashes out. And then my other daughter, she tends to hide under the covers, you know, let me just kind of deal with it in myself. Well, my youngest, I didn't know how she was going to walk through everything. Her friends were pulling away because she was angry. And one day her sister said to her, you're so angry all the time. And my little one, her name was Colby, she's now... 28. <laughs> but yeah. her little lips started quivering and she says, I hate my life. And she was missing her daddy. Right. Uh, yeah. So yeah. she goes into her bedroom, slams the door. And I just went to the door and I just started knocking on the door and I said, honey, let me love you. I said, let me love you. And in that moment, she opened up the door and she collapsed into my arms. Yeah. I heard her tell years later that that was the turning point for her, that she started to find compassion for herself. But what was so interesting in all of that is a couple of years later, I ran into one of her teachers who was her teacher during that time when her dad died and she was angry. And I reintroduced myself to him. He didn't remember me. So I said, I'm Colby's mom. He says, oh my gosh. He said, she is the most respectful child I've ever had in my class. And I said, really? Because I, you know, experienced this anger, you know, and she was respectful to me, but I just didn't know how she was out in the world. And he says, how did you make her that way? And I have to tell you guys, I was stumped. I was totally stumped because I'm sitting there going, I've never spanked my child. I think I gave her one time out because she was pinching her sister when she was about two years old. And I told her <laughs> to go sit and think about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I had to think for a second. And I said, wow. I said, well, I respected myself mm -hmm. and I respected her. He was flabbergasted because you know, we live in the Southern environment where spanking is really big and punishment is really big because people think that's what's going to make their children be good and what's going to receive God's love and people's love. But he was flabbergasted. He says, I've never heard anything, anybody say anything like that. And I said, well, it's kind of by like trial by error because I just chose yeah. not to hit my kids because I know that it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't, it doesn't make a child better. So for me, that whole experience of my anger and then healing my anger and then being able to look at my child through the eyes of love rather than my own lack and pain, but to look at her through the eyes of love and say, I know you're hurting. I know that, that you know, your life is really struggling. You just lost your daddy. Yeah. And, you know, that was huge. So to be able to say that, and then years later, when she was about 19, hearing her tell a man, that was the turning for it, point for me because my mom didn't judge me. She loved me. Huh. Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard so. It, research shows that kids' brains develop over, you know, I think it's 25 years before your brain mm -hmm. is full, you know, at full capacity and it develops throughout yeah. life. But up until that point, parents are the prefrontal cortex of their kids' brains mm. because they develop their own. And so anything that the parent does that interrupts that growth mm -hmm. could, could have an impact later on in life. You know, right. so things like spanking and 
you know, even the idea, it's not, you know, I'm listening to a book called Running on Empty, and it talks about some of the things you were taught, but also some of the things you were not taught, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the experience of somebody that's maybe going through neglect versus abuse. Oh, yeah. And neglect can be as impactful as somebody that's going through abuse. And so, absolutely. you know, the idea there is that that brain is developing. If you can create a space where you can start teaching them those ways of being, so that later on in life they can use that they'll they'll Absolutely. do it for themselves they're powerful kids are powerful we don't need to rein them in well and I, yeah. I i yeah i agree with you completely and it's so funny that you're saying that because the same daughter who had all the friends pulling away from her when she was in high school we always look at the mirror is what is the outer world showing you about how you're treating yourself because yeah. if the world feels hard then that means you're probably holding beliefs that you deserve punishment or that you're wrong or you're bad. So I remember one day these kids, it was by the time she got in high school, Kobe got in high school and these girls were being kind of mean. Kobe was trying to reach out. And one girl said, your dad died several years ago. You should get over it by now. Wow. And it was really wow. harsh. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember Kobe being very emotional and saying they have no compassion for me. And I was just listening to the wording and I said, okay, babe. I said, so let's listen to this. Remember, everything's a gift. I, and I'm sitting there kind of just holding her and rocking her, you know, have her in my arms. And I said, what I'm hearing you say is they have no compassion for you. So that tells me you have no compassion for yourself. We have to take this and look at it because yes, you had your anger, but instead of judging that anger, you need to have compassion that that's that you were in pain, that you were hurting. And that again was a turning point wow. because we were able to see what was the world telling her? Because energetically, you, you're talking about the prefrontal cortex. We know that our mind has our thoughts, create our feelings and our feelings project uh, a vibration and that whatever vibration we're holding is what we're going to attract to us. So we're going to see even if we don't know the beliefs, because our subconscious mind right when, runs 95% of our life. So even if we don't know the beliefs that are there and we may not be aware of how we're treating ourselves, our world is a gift. It's showing us how we're treating ourselves. It's like for me, I was on that hamster wheel and things might show up and then it would feel like it would fall away because I was treating myself that I didn't deserve to receive that kind of abundance. So yeah. this is one of the things that I've really tried to instill in my kids. And, and, you know, and, and if there's issues with friends, if there's, you know, I do the same thing with my, my husband now, I've been now married for 13 years for, with Charlie and uh, cause Steve died uh, after 17. And so, you know, I really help them try to understand that your outer world is a mirror to your inner world. And so your focus has to be on your inner world of how am I loving myself? How am I treating myself? Because if you want the world to treat you with kindness and gentleness, you need to be kind and gentle to yourself. Because there can be people who are treating you with kindness and gentleness. And if you're not in that that space of understanding it, you're not going to receive it. You're not going to see it. I mean, how many times... Have we seen a friend complaining about their husband or their girlfriend or somebody treating them poorly? And we're all watching going, we're not seeing any of this. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to receive it unless we're starting to experience it for ourselves. So that's really key, I think, in our families to be able to bring that message in is love yourself. And so you can experience the love around you that I, there's I so think, much love here. I think that's part of the uh, the receiving, the capacity to receive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the word surrender, to render over, to give over. You yeah. know, that idea that somebody has to be a receiver for there to be a surrender. Without yeah. a receiver, there is no surrender. And so, right. being able to receive, going back to that idea, um, when you love you and you accept you, others will accept you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, being gentle with yourself around that, what we tend to do is shame ourselves. You know, I think Brene, yes. Brene Brown talks about it extensively of being yes. vulnerable around that, that hiding and that anger. I mean, she had it too. I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have it when I don't voice what I'm feeling and what I need. I get angry. Yeah. yeah me too. What comes well, up for you as you hear that? I'm the same way. Yeah. When when I suppress my voice, I get angry. It's the little girl inside of me saying, oh, you're going to put me in the corner again. Yeah. I have these feelings and you're telling me that I don't matter. 
Mm. So when you suppress them, and so what you're doing is you're really either putting me in the corner or shutting me in the closet. And I really need to be heard. I really need to be seen. I really need to be valued. But it starts with me doing that for her first rather yeah. than looking for the outer world to do it. So I absolutely I think agree. of uh, dirty dancing. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, the, the honey badger on, on YouTube. Oh, my gosh. If you, if you haven't watched that, that's funny. I don't think I've seen that one, but I've definitely seen dirty dancing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, when we get cornered, here's the, the thing. Anytime anybody feels cornered, I think most people, when they feel cornered, let me say it that way. Uh, we'll fight back in some form. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, and it can come out pretty violent and, and damaging. And so the goal is to not get cornered and we're the ones that kind of put ourselves in that corner by not. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll you tell know, you a really cool. Ex oh, go ahead. I'm sorry to mean, no, I was just going to say something about like the programming. Like we, we do the best we can with the, with what we have. Mm -hmm. And when we're young and, and these things happen and we view it in our, in our way, however we perceive the world. So, you know, like I have to do this to get my dad's love. That was my story. I have to be this way. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, I'm not worthy for the blessings that, that should come or, or whatever, or of his love. I'm worried about the judgments of others and, you know, and, and how they perceive me. And, mm -hmm. and if you, and we tell ourselves these stories and we start perceiving the world in a certain way. So we develop an operating system yeah. and this operating system, uh, if we don't understand it, then we keep operating on that same level all throughout. And we start growing up and our bodies get bigger and we get older and we, we, we have that same operating system and it can be, it can serve us to a point because our, we're trying to protect ourselves. Absolutely. But then as we get older, it stops serving us. Mm -hmm. And, and listen, it's funny that this is coming up because this is stuff that's going on in my life and in my operating system, my judgments and my, how I perceive how others are perceiving me, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm, I'm unpacking and going through right now. And then also <laughs> the, find that going back to the truth of what's really true is, is it's, it's, um, it's emotionally, uh, I was going to say disturbing. It's not disturbing. It's, it's, it's emotion. It's just emotional. It's a lot to, to <clears throat> my throat chakra is kind of going off here. It's a lot that uh, is coming up for me. Mm. And so then realizing and recognizing the truth is sometimes a little bit painful because you realize how you've operated for all this time. Mm -hmm. But then it's also so freeing to be able to go backwards and to say, Oh my gosh, that's how I lived my life for this long. But then the empowerment that comes from it, from recognizing truth and then having a, an option, a choice now to go, ah, I don't have to carry that anymore. I can, I can be whatever I want to be now. Absolutely. It's so amazing. You know, what's so beautiful about that is that I look at spiritual agreements. I'm a spiritual coach and so, and I'm an intuitive. So I look at the agreement and and the way I look at it for you is that you're getting all of this awareness now because look how you're serving. Mm -hmm. And so that you can be able to share it so authentically and courageously the way you just did is huge. I know for me when I'm teaching my worthiness quotient course or enlightened mom courses or whatever I'm doing, I always share my story. I share what I went through because that becomes a point of service to the people who are participating. And so you're walking through all of this now as you're unpacking it. And yes, it can be hard, but this is why I, you know, I call out my group women leaders of love is because we're so courageous and we're walking through all of this stuff so that then we can serve our families, our communities and the world by saying, okay, I've walked through this. This is the wisdom I've gleaned. And now I can share with you. Of course, you're going to have to go through your own process, but if this gives you a little bit of information that might help it make it a little easier, then that's huge. That's huge. You know, for me, I have to tell you the same way. I was, the way my, I sh it showed up for me is I was really angry. My dad died in 95 and, and I realized that he had no forgiveness of himself. And I also realized he had lost everything in bankruptcy. He ended up becoming an alcoholic. So he really became reclusive. I mean, it was awful for his last 10 years of his life. So when I was looking at his life when he died, I thought, Dad, 
had no forgiveness of himself. He couldn't receive our love. And so I said, that's it. I'm becoming my dad. I wasn't, a, I wasn't drinking, but I could tell that I didn't have any forgiveness for myself. So I said, the buck stops here. And I ended up in therapy. And then the therapist says, you need to get into meditation. You're wound really tightly. So I did. And, I, and, and that became my journey. But what was so interesting is I was meditating on the word unconditional love. Okay. And I just read a book that I love to this day. I still love it. It's called Love Without Conditions by Paul Farini simple read, but it was beautiful. This was back in the 90s. So I'm reading this book, and then I sit down to meditate. I'm simply meditating on unconditional love. I was, I was actually laying on my floor in my bedroom in front of my fireplace in Southern California because uh, it was a cool day, and I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, little Terry, the little five-year-old inside of me, shows up. I mean, she just she is as clear as this day in my mind. I start sobbing because I realize, <clears throat> excuse me, that she is the one that I had been abandoning my whole life. Every time I looked for someone to love me, I abandoned her. I realized that I had been sticking her in the corner. And I heard in my ear as I'm sobbing, recognizing this and how painful it is, I hear in my ear, get up and write this. This is the beginning of your book. I mean, it was clear as day. So I get up and I wrote the first passage. Today I said a little, hello to a little girl. And the passage is, is literally about this big. And it oh. was, that was the beginning of my first book, Message Sent, which was really a journal. And then I made it into a book. But it was how I started, as you said, unpacking what was going on around me and realizing that of the beliefs I had held on to my whole life and how those beliefs that I didn't even know existed were running my life and they were keeping me in a state of unworthiness. They were keeping me in a state of feeling like I'm not enough. I'm not lovable. There's something wrong with me. So what did I do? I would constantly try that much harder to prove my worth. And this is what I've discovered is that every time you try to prove your worth, you're coming from a state of either guilt or shame. And those are the two lowest energies that you can hold. You're, you're holding a state of there's something wrong with me, so I'm bad or I've done something wrong or who I am is wrong. And so in that state, you are holding this low vibration. So what has, hold, comes up is you get energy that feels like punishment to you. You get life that shows up. It feels like, like not getting that job you want, not getting that relationship you want because you keep trying to prove your worth. And, and what I learned over that time is that as I'm trying to prove my worth, I stay on this perpetual cycle of stress and struggle because I'm separating from who I am. I'm, I'm separating from how I was created and I'm not loving and honoring who I am. So by becoming that divine parent to that little girl inside of me from what I was shown, and every time I loved her and nurtured her and, and, and treat her as, as if she matters, you know, this is, I started that way. Now it's present tense because I still do this is that every time I do that, yes, something may be painful if I, if I realize I'm reacting in some way or I'm coming from an old belief, but as I unpack it and love myself and allow myself to grieve it, but also to celebrate the healing because gratitude is really key to shift the energy from sadness to celebration and move into that state of gratitude of thank you for this gift, God. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to heal. Thank you for this, this situation showing up in front of me because I used to think it was happening to me. And so I felt like a victim. Now I look at it as, oh, this is happening for me so I can see my programming. Right. And then really move into that state of loving that little girl. And how do I love you? What is your truth? How can I support you? How can I nurture you? And then by me doing that for her, ooh, I start feeling worthy. And now I'm at a high vibration. So I attract abundance to me. And that has been huge. So every time you unpack stuff in your life, you're shifting into a higher state of worthiness. Hmm. And that's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of doing the inner work. Well, that makes me feel better because I'm, I'm like, holy smokes, this is, it was so much going back. But then it was so simple mm -hmm. too. Like it, like <clears throat> I couldn't believe as I was unpacking it, like there was only just a couple things that were, that were causing that operating system to, to play out for all these years. Wow. Once, I, once we discovered the root of it, it, it was easy to just go, 
oh, that's the root of, of, of how you've been operating. Okay. Well, is that true? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what? And, and it was, oh my gosh. And it's, it's kind of frustrating because now I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I, I could have lived things, differently all these years. <laughs> one of the things I keep seeing is that we think that our journey is unique. Yeah. Right. We think we're the only ones going through that. Yeah. And if, if I were to list out my insecurities, the things that the unuseful uh, thoughts and beliefs that come up for me, somebody listening, probably most people listening would say, well, I have that. Oh, I have that. I have that. Mm -hmm. And there'd be some commonality among it or among us, you know? And so the idea that you're alone is, is this idea that you're the only one going through it. Kind of like you, what your dad did is we start to isolate. Right. And we start to withdraw and we pull back, but we don't ever re-engage. And that's the challenge is we come off of that, um, you know, feeling like we can do everything. And then we feel down and we feel lonely and we feel like mm -hmm. we're the only ones and nobody would understand and we're not acceptable. And then we don't come out of it. Right. And so re-engaging in life, you know, in some form, part of that, you know, I love the way Brene Brown does it is she gets vulnerable. If yeah. I'm feeling that, I'm going to tell you. Absolutely. And, and it's one of the biggest and quickest ways to turn your life around is if you're feeling that, start sharing it. Like I share started it, sharing yeah. it. Yeah, go ahead. And what I was going to say is, is, is share it. And one of the things that I do, because I do have a tendency to go, Bleh, you know, that's yeah, my yeah. MO is to just re regurgitate it on the people around me. So yeah. what I've learned over the years, what really works for me, and it may work for someone listening, is to sit down and because the thoughts are in your head and they're wanting to come out, right? They're just yeah. wanting to come out. So I start journaling about it mm. and I, and it may not be pretty in the beginning. It may be that ego speaking. I hate this. So-and-so and da, 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 da. You know, I'm, I'll let it come out. I really acknowledge the pain that is there. And then I'll say, okay, so now that I've gotten all the emotion to, cause I'm very emotional. So I let all the emotion regurgitate and then I'll say, okay, thank you for this healing. I'll immediately go into gratitude. Mm. Thank you for this healing. Thank you for this opportunity to go into deeper into my truth. Cause my truth is when I get aligned with God, this is when I put God first is when I'm honoring and loving who I was created to be and honoring my truth. So I know that my, my journey is to take me into that alignment so I'll just say, okay, so thank you for this gift. Now, I may start writing and say, little Terry, what's hurting inside of you? What's mm. causing you to react this way? And then here's a really cool exercise. I switch the pen to the other hand, which takes you out of your analytical mind and opens you up into your intuitive mind. And I allow her to speak to me. Well, then, you know, she may give me some information, but she can't give me maybe the full answer of what I need. So then I'll call on my guides. I talk to Christ. I talk to Mother Mary. I talk to Michael the Archangel, and I'll say, "Okay, can you can you?" I call in my council. Okay, I have this council. Yeah, I sit down yeah. on my couch and I have a whole council around me, and I'll say, you know, I'll I'll say something, and I'll feel somebody's presence, and and switch the pin to the other hand, and I'll feel them speaking to me. Mm -hmm. That is huge because so now I'm not alone. Hmm. Now I have my own little universe here where I have my inner child, where I'm being the divine parent, and then I'm surrendering to receive intuitive guidance. And we yeah. all have this capability, okay? Because most people think, ah, no, no, we are all capable of receiving intuitive guidance. It's just taking the time to create that connection. And, that, you know, it's so funny because my yeah. husband, he can see me and he'll say, you're not connected. And he'll say, I'm like, oh, you're right. You're, I'm not connected because I may have a couple of days where I don't sit down in my meditation and my prayer and my journaling and me, you know, in, in getting into that space, but I'll, I'll go get connected. And then I can have a conversation that is wise. That is truth. I mean, I, I have my moments where it comes lashing out still. That's I'm a Scorpio that comes out at times, right? It's that little tail when I'm in pain and I have to go, Whoop, come back, come back, come back, come back. Okay. We're lashing out. Let me go take a look at it. And I can take a look at it and then come back and say, I'm really sorry. This is what was going on with me. You know, my intention is not to lash out. This is what was going on. And I need to share with you what I'm feeling. That works. You know, yeah. sometimes it, I, I don't know how it works for you guys. And, you know, in the way you're communicating it, I just don't want to regurgitate everything. Like, I yeah, used there's, to. there's a difference. I, mm -hmm. I've had people come in and just vomit their stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then 
they, it's like a dumping station. Yes. Right? Yeah. And they dump it and then they walk out of the room. And it's like, what the, and I want to swear around <laughs> it. What the hell are you doing? Like, exactly. I'm not a dump, you know, it's like, but if, if there's a dialogue and we can yeah. talk it through and say, look, I don't get to be your dumping station, but let's, let's converse about it. What's going on and having two people that can hold space yeah. for that thing. I, I talk about putting it in the, on the table in between you. You yes. bring that thing and you put it on the table and you both talk about it in this third person, this thing, and you're able to come at it. It doesn't mean anything about anybody. You're just, you're just talking. Yeah. And so there's an understanding that comes from that. What I keep hearing in your, your path here is that, you know, we teach a bit of the, about the 12 journeys of the giant, you know, and, and one of those journeys is waking up to what you're doing, your consciousness. Yeah. Another is acceptance. It doesn't mean you agree with it, but you can accept it is what it is. Then you go into grief, yeah. right? And, and grief is a vital part of the giant's journey because you have sadness and, and grief for what's lost, right? And whether yeah. that's a loss of a person or a loss of a thing, it doesn't matter. It still impacts and then the very next step that you keep hitting on is gratitude from grief to gratitude in that yeah. order, because what it does, is it, it reminds you that there's still something left. There's still enough left that you can regrow with. You take a piece of a, oh, what are they? The succulents. You can tear off a leaf of a succulent and plant it and it'll grow a whole new succulent. Mm -hmm. And if all you had was one leaf of that succulent, you could say that the whole thing's lost, but you have that one thing to grow with and you plant it, you've got a whole new succulent. And, and, it's and our lives are kind of that way. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like, take what's left and now what's possible from mm -hmm. there. Um, man, you're just hitting on so many vital points and it's all, it's all in here yeah. inside of us. It really is. And I tell you, I had to go into that space of gratitude. I, like so many, we see people in lack in our environment. There's a lot of lack on our planet right now. You against me, people mm -hmm. in yeah. want. And if there would be a shift in consciousness of what's the world showing me right now, like we just, you know, we've been walking through this pandemic. What is the pandemic showing us? What's the gift in it? I, it's hard to see a gift in the pandemic. The way I see it is the pandemic is showing us that we have a virus in our minds. We have mm -hmm. a virus about how we're living our lives. We have a virus about you against me. We're separate. What if we said, oh, we're all in this together. We are the we and we make up the body of God and each of us is playing our parts so that we can learn and grow and move into a state Beautiful. of love and unity. Yeah, right there. That is, you know, the liver can't take the space of the heart and run properly. It just doesn't work, right? Mm -mm. Each individual has their individuality that that can get lost in, in, I don't know, in a way of giving that up. In a way, it looks like our society wants to give that up for fairness, equality, um, they say equity, all these terms that come up, but that individuality when done, you know, appropriately can really serve not only the individual, but society. Absolutely. And when a person takes care of themselves and they're whole inside, then they're going to be whole with others. Mm -hmm. the, the liver and the heart work together, but they're totally different. Right. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And this is why it's so important, even in our homes, that we see each other as individuals mm. and it starts in the home. It starts as the individual and then it filters into the home. If you've got a family, if you've got a partner or whatever, my husband and I, Charlie and I, we made an agreement on our wedding day. It was part of our ceremony that we were committed to being an enlightened couple and an enlightened family, which was so cool. And what that means for us is that our number one goal is unconditional love because unconditional mm. love moves you into alignment with God. And so for us, it was, I'm going to learn from you. You're going to learn from me. And our commitment is that we will stay in that state of surrender that I may be reacting to you, but I'm going to see you as my gift that mm. you are showing me myself and vice versa. So I'm probably way better at doing this than he is because he gets so caught up in his, his creative work with his, you know, we have a, a coffee company and, yeah. but, but I, I can, and he trusts me to bring it back to center that I can bring it to his attention and then he'll take a look at it. It was so cool though, a couple of years ago, cause he said to me, he says, I knew you loved me. So he said, but in, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had a moth. Oh. Yeah. You're supposed <laughs> to pay attention going. to something. Yeah. And, uh, so 
Um, Probably a symbol. So a couple of years ago, and I think the moth is the sexual energy. Okay. So like yeah. second chakra, which is where we manifest, right? And and yeah. really give birth to things. Well, so giving birth to this conversation is perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> so a couple of years ago, Charlie said to me, he said, I feel, um, he said, I knew you loved me, but until you taught me to love myself, mm. I couldn't receive your love. And now I do. Now think about the power in that. When you commit in your relationships, even if you're not in a partnership, maybe it's a friendship, maybe it's with a parent, maybe it's with a child, maybe it's with your coworkers, you know, if you can bring that conversation in where you start looking at it, we are going to come from a mindset of love. We're going to come from a mindset as an enlightened partnership, mm. an enlightened couple, an enlightened marriage, an enlightened family, that our whole goal is to choose love, to move into alignment. And as we move into alignment, we're now going to feel worthy because we're treating ourselves as if we matter. Remember how I was telling you about my, my parents, they put themselves on the back burner. And, and so I learned that it wasn't okay to receive from watching their actions, that they put my sister and me first, then each other first. They did not take the time to connect on the inside. They didn't take mm. the time to express their feelings. You know, God gave you a voice, use it. You, you've been given this opportunity to speak and you have feelings, speak them, get in touch. And so that for us is what, you know, when you start doing that and you're doing it for yourself first, and then you're coming from that space where you're sharing and connecting, you're now becoming an enlightened family. You're now becoming the we instead of you against me, which is sad. Yeah, what happens a lot yeah. in marriages, especially, <laughs> right? They start falling apart. So even, when we do that, we feel worthy. Yeah. Say that. Yeah. Well, even in community. Yes, yeah. We see in groups and out groups. And so, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So it's so important for us to say, I choose unconditional love. And that has to start with me loving myself, me looking at the beliefs that are keeping me out of alignment with God, that are keeping me in a state of a low worthiness quotient, which means how open am I to receiving love, nurturing, and support? simply for being me, not performing, right? You know, am, am I really being in that state? Am I giving myself permission to be in that? And then by being in that state of love and nurturing, you come into peace, you start moving mm -hmm. into trust. It's no longer you against me. It's like, oh, I get you're hurting, right? Which is huge because right now we see so many people are hurting and they're coming to battle with each other. Rather yeah, than saying, they come with their swords, right? Yeah, they yeah. come with their swords instead of saying, oh, I'm hurting and you're hurting. Let's see how we learn from one another. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a thought. I want to venture off a little bit on this you okay. know, around love, around the term love. Okay. And if, if we were to dissect and really dive in and, and you can help me maybe see this a little different. Okay. Is acceptance. Acceptance being at the core of everything is, is when we don't feel acceptable, we don't feel accepted or accepting. And, and so when we talk about worthiness and love, acceptance is, is kind of that foundational of yeah. you are who you are in a way, and you're okay the way that you are. And really, it's up to you to be okay with who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, that could be heard uh, uh, you know, from the space of, well, it doesn't matter how my being affects others, which was would be egocentrical. That, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be the case. This would be more of a space of, I have understanding for me. I have yeah. acceptance for me. I am good enough exactly as I am. And and then in that, I can accept others exactly as they are. To me, that seems like unconditional. Either you can say love or acceptance. It's just like, hey, I've removed the conditions from me. Therefore, I have no conditions for you. And I think they do go hand in hand. Okay. Sometimes, I think sometimes where we may have a hard time getting to acceptance the sense of coming from love in the sense of, I really want to get to that accepted, uh, that acceptance space. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but I'm sitting in a state of knowing that there is a gift here. I'm sitting in a state of my intention is to move into alignment because what my guidance has been is unconditional love is the number one key for everything you want in your life. Because when you move into unconditional love, and you, that is the state of acceptance of moving into alignment. Yeah, okay. But the intention is a little different because 
when I'm saying I'm moving into alignment, my intention is to move into alignment with God. I may not be in acceptance yet. Yeah, but I'm, I like that. I like that. You okay. know, I, I think of J.P. Morgan. He says, you know, within acceptance, there's allowance and accommodation. It could almost be that there's grace and tolerance yes. within acceptance. I can tolerate certain things. I have grace for certain things. There's a more the grace would be the more powerful way to go. Tolerance is almost like what you're saying. Yeah, it is. It's outside of love. Love would be a, a deeper emotion than acceptance yeah. as acceptance could be tolerance. Exactly. It means I'm tolerating this. There, therefore, I'm allowing it to be in my space because of right. that. Right. But it's not quite love. Right. Right. Hmm. right. Have you ever had that experience where maybe you are not in a state of tolerance? You're really ticked off and yeah. you're just yep. really struggling. And so your intention is I'm choosing love. I'm choosing love. But, you know, how do I get from A to B or A to Z yeah, in that yeah. situation? And that when you, when you, go through the process. I know for me, as soon as I go into gratitude, like, God, this really pisses me off, but I know there's a gift here. And I know there's something here that's moving me into alignment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I allow myself to go through the process of saying, what is the belief? What is the pain? I allow myself to go back. I let little Terry, the little five-year-old inside of me, yeah. take me back to the original point where this pain is coming from. I call this where they're retrieving the gift of love process. Yeah. And I allow myself to go back, 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 back. And I, and when I get to that point and I say, what is the belief I took on? I can move into wow. a state. Yeah. I can move into a state just like this of being so angry at something and having such a huge awareness of a belief that I've been holding on to that I go to my knees in tears in gratitude to the person who I thought was doing something to me mm. and in gratitude of saying, thank you for showing me myself. So it's no longer tolerance. It's not just acceptance. It is love. Thank you for Man. playing your part. I have a weighted blanket, right? Heavy 15 mm -hmm. pounds. You know, there's psychologically, they're supposed to help you. Yeah. The, the idea of grief and gratitude, we, we teach this, you know, that, that they start with that GR root, mm -hmm. uh, which generally means heaviness, right? So grief yeah. is heavy. Yeah. Gratitude is almost the embracing, like that blanket, the embracing of the heavy. Yes, like it is. The loving of the heavy. It is. It is just total compassion. Hmm. It's love. It's all of it together. And I tell you, I think if, if we were to teach anything on this planet, it would be gratitude because gratitude takes you there. It takes you to the love. It, it really is the key mm. to go from judgment, reactionary state to what is the gift in this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and allows you to move across that divide of lack and pain and suffering into, wow, this is so freaking cool. You know, oh my gosh, this is, I thought this guy was a jerk and he's just taught me about myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to be able to do that. So now the way I walk through life is, is we're used to, I had my defenses up. Okay. Yeah, I felt like I was yeah. always ready for a battle is I'm not afraid of life anymore because I know that if something shows up, it's just going to take me deeper because I trust myself enough now to use my tools. I mean, there was a, there were many years that I hid, even doing all of this work, because one, I'm an intuitive and I'm a healer. It went very much against a lot of people thinking my religious programming. And I had to get to the, to the place of going, you know, this is love. I'm, you know, I'm, this has mm. nothing to do with religion. This is love. You know, being an intuitive yeah, is just outside. a God-given gift. Yeah. Do outside what? of any beliefs is, you yeah. know, this idea of love. You've, you know, an atheist can love. Exactly. Exactly. And so to, to just be in this space of saying, I can trust that I can go out and because I love to get guided. I love to get a hit and say, oh, you need to go drive down to the coffee shop today and hang out. And then all of a sudden there's somebody who shows up and we have a conversation and they say to me, oh, my gosh, I needed to have this conversation today. So now I'm being in the service. Right. Yeah. We're used to I might try to hide a little bit. But now because I know that no matter what shows up, no matter how bad it is, if, it, if something shows up, if I'm holding a belief that, that I don't even know is there, and maybe it feels, if it shows up that it feels really scary, 
that I, I know that that's my cue to just look at little Terry, the little five-year-old scoop her up and say, I got your back, baby. I mm. love you. And I'm with you. And you're worthy of love. And then surrender. Ask my guides to come in. Ask God to take over. And then take action from there. So now I have, I'm using my spiritual tools. I'm walking in faith. I'm walking in, you know, a deep sense of trusting myself and the universe, and I'm not feeling abandoned anymore. And those are the things we want. We want to feel safe, right? So this yeah. is why we get scared and we don't allow ourselves to be more. We don't allow ourselves to grow. I, and so go ahead. What yeah, you I have a thought around, well, it's just coming up and it might be a little random here around tolerance, right? We, we live mm -hmm. in a society, we're starting to be in a society where there's intolerance. Yeah. And, and which is a, a really low level of way of Ooh. being right mm -hmm. and even moving to the space of tolerance is a higher level of being but bridging from tolerance to grace right to that mm -hmm. allowance and acceptance and then to pure love i mean that's that's the ultimate bridge right there so even bridging intolerance to tolerance yeah right now would be it's a huge. huge move for our for our country for our world absolutely i agree 100 yeah. percent. and i think a way that we can do that is to recognize, again, I'm a spiritual coach, so I see everything as a spiritual agreement. Yeah. Right? So I'll give you an example of this. When uh, when the World Trade Center was attacked, yeah. of course, we were all in just like, right? Um, and it was really hard to look at. So I went into meditation because I was like, God, I'm really angry about this. Mm. Give me some example what's going on. And I know there's got to be something here you're showing me. And uh, what I was shown is that this is what we do to each other. We attack each other. We're, it's power struggles. And so I, I kind of came into peace about it. Well, then a year later, I was in New York City right at that. It was like the anniversary. And I was sitting in Central Park uh, on a bench. There's a woman that sat on the bench at the other end. We just started talking. We, yeah. were, near, we were near the ponds where they have the little sailboats and stuff. And and she said, you know, I was here a year ago, right after 911. And I said, really? She said, yeah, look at these people here. She said, they're all milling around. She says, that's not what was happening that day. And I said, why? What happened that day? She goes, everybody was staring into the water. She goes, I don't understand why. She goes, I have a picture of it on my refrigerator. She goes, but everyone was staring into the water. She said, it was bizarre. And I said, well, what do you think of when you stare into the water? She said, seeing my reflection? I said, yeah, seeing your reflection. I said, this is what we're doing to ourselves in our world. We're you against me. We're in power struggles. Mm, wow. Right? Yeah. And so she, I gave her my card, and she went home. She sent me an email that afternoon. She says, oh, my gosh. She said, this is so absolutely right. And she said, what was interesting is that New York City really came together mm. after that. And they worked together as a community to, to, to get strong again. And she said, people were kinder to each other because they were being awakened. And so I think this is what's happening on our planet right now is we're being awakened to see our lack, to yeah. see our division, Right. And all of that is based in a lack of worthiness. Mm, wow. Hey, um, you, you know, you talk about <clears throat> like uh, all of this stuff, right? Well, like we've, we've unpacked so much. Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like, I'm going to go back and listen to this uh, for a, a long time. Like this, I think this, on my to-do list was solve the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> we might have just done that right now. <laughs> yeah. so there's, a, there's a real good uh, map if you go backwards and yeah. listen to this. but. From here, um, the hardest part has been for me in the in the past, and I'm learning. I'm learning this. It, it's almost a skill or an ability or a, an awareness, um, an allowance. Those are the words that come up for me currently, and I'm mm -hmm. sure they'll shift a little bit. But it's the trust. It's trusting that these things are happening for me to me for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah the the loving who i am and and in even who i was it was one of the one of the uh it was cassidy that said um that she's grieving the person that she once was mm. and uh and then and loving that that uh, that person that little terry that little ryan 
that 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 tried their very best to keep Ryan safe. Yeah. Absolutely. But then also trusting that okay, like it's it's going to be okay, that this is divine timing, that you're right where you need to be. Nick Nick has a rock that has an X right through the, the middle of it. This rock um is is the most powerful physical tool of just showing you that you're in the right place. It's okay. You're right where you need to be. X marks the spot. You're the treasure. You're yeah. the giant. You're the you're an, a, a, a miracle. You're a walking, living, divine miracle. And uh, trusting that sometimes, I don't know why. Maybe it's the control, like I said. Maybe it's the letting go, um, f- at least for me. Can I give you my two cents yeah, on that? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't start crying. I'm already crying. I'm getting emotional. That's okay. Ah. I do this. I see this a lot. Um, so, and I, I really just want to honor you for your vulnerability because that is huge. I wish, I mean, I wish more men would do that, right? I mean, they would just soften our planet if more men would be so vulnerable and courageous because it really is courageous. So when you are feeling that way, that lack of trust, Think about that little boy inside of you who didn't feel enough for, you know, whatever all the emotions are that are coming up. His trust needs to be now in you so that, remember how I was talking about earlier that I pick up that little girl in my lap and say, I got your back and I love you. I became the divine parent to her. I was shown to mother her the way I always wanted to be mothered. And because my mother and dad were wounded, they both came from abuse. So they didn't know they were doing their best. And I honor that in them. And they, they tried to break some of the cycles, but some of the stuff still was not good, right, for me. And, and so I've had to learn to love myself the way I always wanted to be loved. Now, I can look at my mom and dad now in spiritual agreement and saying, wow, you pay, played your part perfectly, because my mission now is to help people unwrap all of that stuff, unpack it, as you said earlier, and to move into that space of love. So it's me being that divine parent. So what what I I remember one time I was coaching this woman and she could not get her inner child to come out. It was as if the inner child was hiding under the table in my office. So when she finally came out, she realized that that little girl did not trust her, her, the adult to take care of her and love her and nurture her and protect her and really hear her and treat her as if she mattered. So she stayed hidden. So the trust aspect is when you start loving that little kid so much that that child feels safe. Okay. And you're being compassionate to that little kid you're being accepting of that little kid and you're saying, no matter what, I have your back. I love you. I love you no matter what. There's nothing inside of you that can change that love. There's nothing. And then you continue your commitment to do the healing. And then the other aspect for me is, again, opening up to receive divine guidance. And and that has been huge for me. I think of it as my own little holy trinity. I'm the divine mother to my inner child, and then I surrender to the universe. That builds trust because I was so afraid of the world. I mean, I was afraid of everything. And as I said earlier, I had my fists up. So I didn't trust anything. Even if you look at myself, if, you, if you're into numerology, it's like my whole thing is about trusting myself. So... That process of talking to my, I keep looking over here because I'm, she's in, right here. My little inner child is sitting right here next to me. So I keep looking at her and, and she looks at me and, and I see her from my mind's eye, but I just, I see her and I hear her when I'm driving down the road, she's in the car. I'm talking to her. I, you know, pictures around where I can see her and be, and remember her. So that trust, when you will, continue to build it and be the divine parent, knowing that when you're reacting and you're losing that moment, and this is this really helped me to understand this, is as if the adult left the room and the child is standing there going, I'm so afraid, I'm so scared. And she's almost like she's throwing a temper tantrum, but it may be a fearful tantrum or, you know, I mean, it's all fear, but there's something going on. 
And if I can just say, oh, the adult, my in my mind, my woman leader of love, the divine parent, he's just come back in the room. I need to come back in the room and pick up this kid and mm -hmm. use my tools. That right there starts building safety. It starts building trust. It starts building that pathway from lack into inner abundance, feeling as if you're seen, heard, and valued, which then is a state of worthiness. And now you can really open up and receive the love and nurturing and the support that you need from the universe, from the people around you. But it starts with you being that divine parent to that little kid. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think um, many people missed out. You know, we look back, the childhood, the development, mm -hmm. um, many of us missed out on things that we could have had, but we're not alone. I mean, that's that's a good chunk of people. Mm -hmm. And so our opportunity here, and, and maybe beyond responsibilities and opportunity, is to be the parent that we never had. Absolutely. You know? And so that that really is what I'm hearing strongly in this message is, you're, you're the, you're all of it. And so if you missed it, if it wasn't there, then give it to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my parents, we were the typical American family, as I said earlier, I mean, my, we, I mean, we were probably upper middle class because daddy had a very successful real estate company for a while and there was not beatings or anything like that. I had some spankings. I mean, my parents loved me. They did everything for us. They were your typical family. But my parents came both from abuse. Mm. When they had me, I was the oldest. They were reading a, uh, a doctor, Dr. Spock, who Dr. Spock said, don't pick up your child when they're crying because you will spoil them. So my 19-year-old mother and my 21-year-old dad thought they were doing the right thing. Mm. So they chose not to pick me up. Well, I just started reading Oprah's new book called What Happened to You with this doctor. I forget the doctor's name. I was looking to see if I had the book right here, but I don't. And instead of saying what's wrong with you, you say what happened to you because you know our brain is what creates our reality in the sense of what's going on in our thoughts. Well, if you are not getting what you need in the, fir the first two months now, they found in research, the first two months that sets you up for the rest of your life of how you're going to experience life. So I took on a belief, and I'd already figured this out before I read the book or started reading the book, but I had already figured out, even in the womb, I took on my mother's energy of lack and fear. Um, her and my dad, they got married. I was born 11 months later. They were young. She said they had all these tchotchkes on the window, and by the end of the year, they were all broken, so there was a lot of anger. So I was sitting in that energy. My brain was being wired already. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so when I came into those first few months, they did what they thought was love, but I took on a belief that I am not worthy of receiving love, nurturing, and support. Okay. A baby needs to be picked up. It needs to, when it's crying. And I think when they shifted a little bit was one night mom said she was sitting in the tub and daddy was in the bathroom and I was screaming in the crib. And she finally said, why don't you go check on her? And I was hung in the bumpers. Oh. Yeah. So I think that kind of woke them up. But then when my sister came along uh, 21 months later, my mom put her foot down, said, no, I want a rocking chair. Now my sister all of a sudden is being rocked. And mom said, you were clamoring to get up in the rocker. And I'm like, of course I was, because mm. I didn't get that. So my sister and I, you know, when you look at children and you say, well, they're raised in the same household, they may have not been raised the same way, though. Right, right. Right? Yeah. And so we each have a different experience. So, But what I can look at now is I really, truly believe that I would not change any of it. And the reason I wouldn't change any of it, because as I get to serve now in helping people become the divine parent to themselves. Yeah. Terry Britt wouldn't be the same person. Mm -mm. Had it been any different, right? Yeah. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here today if it had exactly. been any different. And so exactly. there's gratitude in that. Yeah. That's the spiritual agreement. That's mm -hmm. the spiritual agreement. Can do I, I don't know how much time I have, but can I share one quick little story yeah, with you guys? Absolutely. So uh, this is, I don't think I got the importance of being what I call the divine mother to little Terry until I got really sick back in 2010. I had this disease called Chiari malformation, which is where the brainstem 
slides down into the spine because your brain, you have too much brain in your head, so it pushes down. <laughs> right. That's what I tell myself, okay? Yeah. But, <laughs> so I got a big brain. I got a yeah. big brain. So it cuts off your cervical fluid. Well, mm. that it can show up as losing your eyes, losing your, your hearing, losing your appendages. For me, it started out that I was choking constantly. I was falling constantly. I couldn't load my dishwasher. I mean, my life pretty much came to wow. a standstill. So in the States, they go in, they cut out the back of your skull, they uh, cauterize the spine to create an opening so the cervical fluids can flow. And, um, and then hopefully, hopefully you get better. Well, it's pretty barbaric. They put a plate in your head. It's hours of surgery. So I kept putting it off. Yeah. Well, my symptoms got worse. I mean, there were points in time, you know, I'm a writer. So I'd sit at my computer and I'd just start crying because I didn't feel as if I could put A and B together. I mean, I was a mess. So for two years, I put off having that surgery because I thought this feels so barbaric. But what I did during that two years is I kept going deeper into loving myself. I kept saying, what's coming up for me? Talking to little Terry. And I did a lot of healing, inner work. Well, at the end of the two years, I got up one morning, got out of bed, and I fell over my foot. Now, my foot wasn't asleep. It's just it wasn't there. And I went, okay, I'm starting to lose my appendages. That was really scary because you end up in a wheelchair. You know, it was bad. Yeah. So I just sat there and I said, okay, God. Okay, I'm ready to have this surgery, but if there's a kinder, gentler way, show me the way. And I let it go. The next day, my hubby and I decided we lived in Destin, Florida at the time, and there's an outdoor mall there. So we decided we would go over and get some food. I see a woman with a dog. We have to go see the woman with the dog. And her husband walks up, and I recognize him as someone who had done some roofing for us. And then I hit, it hit me that their son had been a world champion racing wave runner. So I asked, how's your son? And she, the mom says, oh, he's really sick. He hasn't been able to race. And I said, what's wrong with him? She said, well, he's got this weird disease called Chiari malformation. No way. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So I dropped down, my mouth, you know, dropped open. I tell them yeah. I have this disease. So I'm looking at this and I said, well, he's, is he having the surgery? And they said, he's scheduled in New York, but have you heard about this doctor in Spain? And this doctor in Spain, they said, yeah, he does a cutting edge surgery. There's a tendon at the bottom of the spine. If it's damaged, he goes in, he clips it, and it helps release the spine so the Chiari goes away. She said, it's a 45-minute surgery, and you're out of the hospital the next day. No way. Wow. So yeah. this even gets better, okay? So yeah. I'm saying, oh, my gosh, I know I'm a candidate, and I know there's a miracle showing up because I've been loving and nurturing myself and moving myself into a high-worthiness quotient. I Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we leave it. Right there on a cliffhanger. Oh, come back in, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> She'll be back here in just a second. Yeah. Uh, in, in the meantime, Capri, I just uh, wanted to tell you that you have an amazing dad. Do you know that? He's pretty. Well, I know. You, you'll learn. He's amazing. Make sure you give him lots of hugs. He's got a shirt that says free hugs. He's just waiting. Yeah. Got to make sure you love on your daddy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pretty incredible. Free hugs. We'll, we'll see if she comes back on here. You know um, what I got from that too, Nick, too? is like yeah. the, the um, talking about creation and, and uh, manifestation. Okay, you're yeah. back. Perfect. I don't you know left what us just happened. Hey, I don't what? know what just it's happened. It's an important message. It's, we <laughs> know that every time there's something vital, <laughs> technology will kill. So. I don't know. It was like, well, wait, okay. So anyway, so um, I'm a candidate for the surgery yeah. and I go to Spain. And um, as I'm going to Spain, I couldn't make up my mind where to stay. So my husband says, just choose a hotel for three days and we'll figure it out when you get there. So we get there. I've only chosen a hotel for three days. And we, the first day in the hotel, I, I mean, we literally just gotten off the plane. I start going through the hotel brochure and it says, monastery tour. And I went, Oh my gosh, monastery tour. I said, I've been hearing monastery in my meditations for months. We must go. So we get on the bus that afternoon hmm. to go up to Montserrat. And as we get on the bus, the, 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 the tour guide says, we're heading to Montserrat. It's one of the seven most sacred mountains in the world. And people come here and often have encounters with God. So my Charlie, my Charlie and I are going, Whoa, you know, so we get up there, we do the tour. We're getting back on the bus, and all of a sudden, I turn around, and I realize that what looks like part of the monastery is a little hotel. And I said, oh, my gosh, this is where I'm supposed to stay. So sure enough, I went in, 
They said there was a room available, went back to the city, had my surgery, stayed one day, came back up to the mountain of Montserrat. I'm walking around the mountain of Montserrat four days later, hiking around after having my surgery. Okay. Wow. Kinder, gentler yeah. way. So I asked for that. So I sit in the monastery, um, the little hotel and I'm like, God, why did you bring me here? What is the reason? What is this all about? And I, and I, you know, felt this nudge to read about the monastery and it said in honor of the divine mother. And I said, that's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I read something else and it says the divine mother takes you to God. And I went, Hmm. Then I hear in my ear, and this is what you've been teaching. So think about everything we've been talking about, becoming the parent. Mm. When we become that divine parent and look at things from a spiritual perspective, when we take that child up and love that little kid, we move into alignment. The divine parent takes you to God. The divine mother takes you to God. Is where you move into alignment, feeling safe, feeling nurtured, feeling worthy. This is what we're all being called to do right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Ryan, what other thoughts do you have? I just love the message. And, uh, you know, you, you didn't know the how to. You just put it out there and, and released it and, and asked God if there's a, if there's a kindler, kinder, kinder, gentler, gentler kind, way. way. Kindler. I like kindler. That. Yeah, it's a new word. Kindler. <laughs> yeah. kindler. Yeah. That's more kind kindler gentler. ways. Yeah, yeah. Mixed together. But yeah. uh, then, and then, and then the path appeared. The path and, appeared. And that's what we're missing is our world doesn't feel kind and gentle right now because mm -hmm. we're not being kind and gentle to ourselves. Man, that's, I mean, wow. I've got some waking up that I'm doing right now in this episode around that. <laughs> yeah, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, just what, what a phenomenal message and the timing on this for a lot of us, you know, Ryan mm -hmm. say, this is for me. Well, this message is for me too. And, and I'm seeing all the comments it's like this message is for everybody. Oh, good. And so, you know, it's a, a beautiful thing. I could almost imagine this is our 84th episode. Congratulations. Yeah, That's awesome. it's amazing. Um, we could almost go back and, and transcribe all of these episodes and have a book created out of that. It would just be powerful. Oh, wow. Like these messages are impactful. And, and there's so many facets of being a human. You know, you talk about worthiness. Somebody else might talk about love. Somebody else might talk about surviving trauma and forgiveness. And they're all mm -hmm. facets. They're all facets of who we are. Right. And so it's not like we can have Terry Britt on and we're complete. You know, it's like we need all these <laughs> other views because we're so we're we simple but complex. Do. Yeah. We absolutely do. And the one thing I will say, though, is going back to unconditional love, unconditional love equals a high worthiness quotient. Yeah. It means they go hand in hand. Yeah. Okay. So if we each can commit to, I'm choosing unconditional love, I'm going to get in touch with my feelings because your feelings are God's greatest messengers and you get in touch with your feelings and you say, what am I needing to express? Am I settling? Am I allowing myself mm. to be all that I am? Because a lot of times our negative emotions comes from self-suppression. So if are we allowing our lights to shine? And in doing so, that we become that change we want to see in the world. So this is what, if, if we can call everyone to say, I just today I'm committing to unconditional love. Not putting myself on the back burner, but by committing to unconditional love, what's going on inside of me so that I move into alignment with God, that in itself We'll start shifting everything. Yeah, I love it. Other thoughts, Ryan? Any any additional? I just want to thank you for for uh, for showing up and for doing this work for yourself first, going through all the things that you've gone through, the experiences, so that you could grow and, and be exactly where you are right now. And that's with us to share with other people, and then also to move, continue to move forward, sharing your message and helping other people. That's it's, this is so needed. And as you've seen from the comments, I, I don't know how many comments we've had, but it's, it's unreal because, so far. because the oh, message, awesome. it rings yeah. true. And, mm -hmm. and it, and it's, it's something that people are, are desperately searching for. Um, it's, it, it's needed. And mm -hmm. and uh, we need all those out there that they're going through this to to, to um, help others do that as well to waken up to their giant potential as we call it. 
Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for being a giant and uh, for spending some time with us this morning. We appreciate it so much. May I just invite people to take the worthiness quotient quiz? Hell yeah. 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 How do we promote you? Yeah. Tell tell us where to find you, the quotient quiz, all that stuff. We need so it. the worthiness quotient quiz is going to help you really see what your outer world is telling you about yourself. Because a lot of people say, I'm worthy, but then they don't feel like their outer world is really mirroring it. And then we've broken it down into these little subgroups. So it might be around money. It might be around passion. It might be around relationships. It might be around receiving miracles. It can be, it's, we've got these different categories. So you go in and you get really honest. And then at the end, we're going to show you where you really haven't owned your worthiness. Cause you may have it in one area that you're doing great and another area that you're not. And then we're going to give you some steps. And, and that also leads to a webinar where I go deeper into how you can shift it. So you just go to uh, terrybrit.com forward slash quiz. So it's T E R R I B R I T T dot com forward slash quiz and you can take the quiz. Okay, I'm gonna throw that up on the, the board here. Tell me if that looks right. That is correct. Okay. So yeah if you if you get a moment go do that. I'm probably gonna go do that. So yeah. me too. Yeah that's beautiful. What a message. Thank you um, guys. In addition to this we do have our giant creation academy uh, dot com. If you guys will check that out, because uh, we're doing our webinar this uh, 28th of July, and we're teaching the 12 journeys of being a giant. So that's for teachers and parents of kiddos. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So we'll put that back up. And wait, guys, thanks for wait, being wait, a part wait, of this. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait, oh, oh, Capri's oh. got something. Ready to go, <laughs> Hi, Capri. Hi, Capri. Hi. Um, Ryan missed the whole show. I know. Yeah. I've missed all kinds of shows. Yeah. <laughs> Miss she, she, Miss U, she was a Miss USA. Yeah. Way, way back like, in the dark. Know ages. She's like, I don't even know what that is. It's like, oh, oh. Awesome. Well, yeah. everybody, thanks for being a part of this. Uh, continue to watch the episode, share this with the world. <laughs> and uh, as always, go make it a giant day. Mm -hmm. Love you too. Bye right, guys. Thank you.